Um, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the M&A story. We've been focused on it a great deal over the last couple of sessions. Uh, AT&T made an $85 billion offer for Time Warner over the weekend, and J.P. Morgan's co-head of M&A told us this is part of a larger theme. We normally talk about merger Mondays. This was a merger weekend uh, bonanza, and we're very happy to represent at AT&T, Rockwell Collins, and h and respectively. All of these deals have the same underlying theme, which is what is interesting, because they are all completely different industry sectors. One is media telecom, the other one is aerospace, the third one is real estate. But the common driver in all of them is the need for growth. And people are thinking much more creatively about growth. But how much do deals, both stateside and here in Europe, face regulatory hold-ups? We're going to be digging into that with more on the M&A landscape. Let's bring in Ben Ward, head of London Corporate at Herbert Smith Freehills. Bit of a time to be celebrating, it would seem. M&A on the agenda. Will it stay here for the rest of 2016? Well, it's certainly been a very interesting uh, few months uh, on, on the M&A front, and for those involved in M&A work, it's been uh, a pleasure to, uh, to, to be involved in. Uh, I think, though, there are some interesting points that we should be thinking about. If you go back maybe 12 to 18 months, um, protectionism wasn't something that was considered at, at all. Uh, people doing deals had to think about competition uh, clearance, but there was, wasn't really anything else to worry about. And now we're just seeing a little bit more discussion on whether or not governments are themselves going to be looking to block or impede deals based on, on, on protectionism. So it's great to see uh, an, an upturn in M&A, particularly the big ticket deals, uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure that that's just going to continue indefinitely. There will be some uh, checks and balances, I think, to uh, major M&A transactions. Are these the right checks and balances? And indeed, where, is it China that seems to be the biggest concern, particularly to the EU, or is it protectionism more widespread? It's very easy to, to, to indicate that China is the, the issue here. Uh, if you go back a, a few, few weeks when the UK government approved uh, the Chinese investment into Hinkley Point, uh, there was a reference at, at that time that the, government, the UK government may look at um, uh, controlling uh, foreign investment into uh, critical infrastructure, and since then Theresa May has said that she might put in place uh, something which will enable the vetting of, of foreign transactions. Uh, it, frankly, it's, it's very easy just to say uh, it's a China issue. If you look yesterday, you saw that the, the German government uh, putting a hold on the Extron transaction. Uh, that was a, a Chinese uh, investor. Um, and the reason for backtracking on that approval was uh, simply because of unknown security-related information. So it's quite easy to write a story about this. M my, my view, I, I stand back, and China has a huge amount of cash to invest. It has an industrial strategy. All the deals that Chinese investors are doing are very much based on a, a strategy and, and a common, common theme, a common aim. And uh, I, I think that China's here to stay. We may see uh, a few transactions uh, which may not, not proceed or which will be held back. But this is against the backdrop of there being a massive amount of China uh, inbound investment into Europe and the US. How much of what we're seeing at the moment is driven by a kind of countervailing force which is incredibly cheap money. Um, you almost look at the, the Time Warner transaction and think, you know what, let's give it yeah. a go. Yeah. Like, th making these things accretive at these kinds of, uh, this kind of cost of capital yeah. is, is, is not that hard. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in, if you go back to the global financial crisis, there was no liquidity uh, and that was a, a, a real um, a problem for M&A transactions. If you look at the amount of cash that's now available to, uh, to, to companies that want to do deals, both from banks uh, and from, from investment funds. You, you're right, um, the, the, the cost of money is low, it, it's available. When you look at uh, the amount of money which is being borrowed to fund the two uh, major deals that, we've, that have announced over the last few days, it's quite remarkable. And yes, uh, that is fueling activity, there's no doubt about that. Um, will I, do I see any change in that? Uh, I think liquidity seems to be here to stay for uh, a, a while until we see something major in the global uh, financial markets. When we think about kind of what is the, the motivation, and, I, and I'm kind of being a bit glib with the kind of motivation which is, hey, why not give it a go? Yeah. Many of these transactions, though, are driven by, from a Chinese point of view, a desire to acquire technology and global know-how to a desire to acquire growth because of the low growth environment we find ourselves in. How much of this is, is kind of animal spirits and how much of it is the exact opposite of animal spirits? When, you, when, you kind of, when you're on these deals, how much of it is being driven by 
if we don't do this, yeah. like, we're going to be in real trouble, yeah. rather than if we don't do this, we're going to miss an opportunity. Yeah, I, I think there is a, a lot of that. It's very rare now that one sees a strategy which is do nothing. We don't need to do nothing. Let's carry on as we are. That is simply not sustainable for most businesses. Uh, you've got shareholders, uh, public and private, uh, stakeholders wanting to see returns uh, mm. in a low growth environment. You've got boards of directors who need to prove themselves. You've got execs that have incentive plans that they want to cash in. A lot of it is driven not necessarily by animal uh, instinct, but just by um, an, an economy where you know, people always want to, to improve, to do things, to, to, get, to get returns. And I certainly think that that is underpinning what, what's happening now. Confidence is there. There is real confidence in, in a way. But is which it confidence that it's, it's, I've got to do something because I've got to fix my business because I don't know how I'm going to grow the top line, so what I'm going to do is fix the middle of the, I'm going to attack the middle of the P&L. Yeah. Or is it driven by, the, the world is fantastic, there are amazing opportunities out there, we need to go and grasp them, we need to, we need to take, take hold of them. I think it's a balance. I think some people are saying the world is challenging yeah. uh, and that, that creates an environment in which we've really got to work hard to show that, that we're worth um, our, our metal. Ben, cheap money right now. What about cheap assets, particularly when it comes to the UK and the sterling? Are you expecting an M&A sweep through the United Kingdom? Well, certainly, uh, if you look at sterling denominated assets now are significantly cheaper than they were before the 23rd of June for people who, um, are, who whose home currency is, is not sterling. So, yes, uh, the, the lower value of sterling is underpinning a certain amount of, of M&A. But of course you have to look at what sterling might do in one, two, three, five years time. So you might be able to get into the asset in a good value way from a currency perspective, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that that means the whole of your investment cycle is going to be, uh, to be plain sailing. So yes, for sterling denominated assets where the investors are uh, using dollars or other currencies, I think that will continue to underpin a certain amount of M&A activity uh, that comes through the London market. And a busy time for you, Ben Ward, Head of London Corporate at Herbert Smith Freehills. Thank you very much for giving so much of your time with us this morning talking all things M&A.